Okay, well, uh, thank you all for uh, coming along today. Um, if anyone wants a drink, now's the time to grab it, or I'll grab it for you, because uh, we'll try and basically go through the, the two presentations. And once we've done those two presentations, we'll have an opportunity to have a bit of networking, uh, you know, have a chat uh, to hopefully your lawyers, but also to each other. That's the idea of these sort of events that we sort of get to know our clients better and our clients, particularly startup clients, clients interested in the same sorts of things, get the opportunity to talk to each other about their experiences and so on and so forth. So the basic uh, sort of goal of this presentation, the last one we did was on SEO, uh, online acquisition. This one is of course on how to raise capital. We've divided it up into two sections. The first uh, is me, I'm talking on how to go about the practicalities of, of raising money. Uh, and then Ursula will talk about the, uh, the legal side of things, how to actually make sure you're not breaking the law effectively, and, and how to make sure you comply with all the relevant legislation, so on and so forth. So um, I get to talk about the easier stuff. Um, well, I think it's easier. And uh, it's, uh, look, why am I talking about it? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, uh, we've raised, well, hopefully by the end of this, this week, we'll have raised over two million in uh, venture capital for Legal Vision itself. So I spend a lot of my time raising capital, uh, hence uh, I'm partly qualified to talk about it. Secondly, I, I've invested in a number of startups, so I have a good understanding of how they've gone about raising capital and um, some of them have raised quite a bit of venture capital, so much beyond the kind of one, one million dollar mark. And then lastly, here at Legal Vision, although I don't do any of the actual legal work anymore, or I actually never did, but um, I do. Um, you know, I do talk to a lot of clients who are looking to raise capital, and uh, you know, discuss with them again the practicalities of how to actually go about it. So that's why I'm talking about this. Ursula uh, will be covering the legal side of things, and she leads that team at Legal Vision and um, has spent much of her career um, dealing with capital raising. So that's that's sort of why we've set it up this way. The way I've done this is the Ten Commandments, um, and the reason I did that was because there are actually no Ten Commandments. That there is no one way in which you can go about raising capital. There are no hard and fast rules. It is very much uh, a matter for individual founders and companies, and it's very difficult to, to actually say there are any Ten Commandments. I've put together the Ten Rules that I've found to be practical, both from personal experience and from seeing others raise capital. Um, and the reason we've talked about one million is that is a number which, um, in the big scheme of things, um, is not a huge amount. On the other hand, um, it's something that it's hard to raise a million dollars from friends and family. So you're really talking about investors who are looking to generate the capital return on their investment and you're talking a raise of at least a million dollars. And there are various things they're gonna look for uh, that your friends and family are not. And your friends and family will put money in regardless and don't really care about evaluation, really doing it to help you out. Whereas, uh, you know, investors who are either institutional or angel investors are looking for that capital return. Okay, so the first rule is don't kid yourself. Um, we do see quite a few businesses that are trying to raise capital that are never going to generate a capital return for investors. And what we're talking about here is generally lifestyle businesses, small businesses, that have no real ambitions to scale, no real ambitions to get big. And if that's the case, that's great. It's a great business, but it's not a business that an investor is gonna be interested in putting money into. Because the only reason to put money into a business is to get that capital return, okay? Now the chances of any individual angel investment succeeding are very <laughs> low. Most angel investments lose money. Most angel investors who put money into a startup are gonna lose all that money because most startups fail. So if an angel investor is gonna invest in your business, they, they, they have to think that they're gonna get an outsized return. So the potential has to be there for the business to really get big, okay? So that, that's something to really think about. Is the business that you're in or that you're running at the moment a business that someone would want to invest in? Is there any reason for them to invest in it? And I think that's the first thing you should really be thinking about before you go on to the kind of practicalities of actually trying to raise that money. Which leads to the second, be ambitious. The sort of business that is gonna raise venture capital, and, there's not, and you should not start a business to raise venture capital, but if that's part of what you wanna do, 
and, and where you want to go, you need to have an ambitious plan. You need to be wanting to build a really big company. Now we did a survey before this presentation of, of everyone who's come here and asked what's the ultimate goal of your business? What's the annualized revenue number that you want to be hitting in your business? We had a lot of people who said under $5 million. Now, if your goal is to be generating under $5 million as a business, there's no investor that's really going to be interested in investing in that if they're looking for an outsized capital return because this doesn't add up. We had quite a few people who were saying five to 15 million. Again, very difficult to get an outsized capital return if you sell the business down the track for $10 million. For that individual sale, for that individual investor, great, fine. But investors are looking at their, their venture capital investments as a portfolio. And the chances are that most of them are gonna fail. So the one that does succeed needs to be a, a really big return. So what I would do is really sit back and think, all right, well, okay, at the end of the day, five million, five to 10 million might satisfy my personal ambitions, but if it's not gonna satisfy what an investor's looking for, either I don't go down the trying to raise capital route, or alternatively, I get more ambitious. I decide that I wanna be generating 100 million annualized revenue, 200 million annualized revenue. Then you're much more likely to get in investors who are interested in, in investing in the business. The third, and this one's, um, I would say, an Australian focused um, point. It is incredibly hard to raise venture capital. It is really, really hard. Now in Australia, it's next to impossible. There's a few people who've done it, but very, very, very small percentage of founders who've raised money without a business that's actually generating revenue. So a business is not generating revenue, it's got users, it's growing quickly with users, so on and so forth. That, that might work in Silicon Valley. Good luck in Australia, right? There's about two venture capital firms in Australia that will invest in those sort of businesses. So if you're looking to raise money, the, the easiest way or the best slide on your deck is the slide showing revenue going like that, right? That is the best slide on your deck. Now, it, if you don't have the revenue, it makes it really, really, really hard to, to, to raise that money. And look, I think uh, looking around at the businesses we've got here today, they all are firmly rooted in generating revenue. And, that, and that's good. That's, that, that's, that's definitely good. Fourth, this is a small practical one. Spend a bit of money on your slide deck. I see a lot of slide decks. Most of them look like shit, okay? Now, it's not, it, it doesn't cost much to get a graphic designer to go, all right, I'll do a bit of work on the deck, make it look nice, make it look presentable to investors. Because that deck is the first thing that people look at. Now, I've had lots of comments on the Legal Vision deck over the years, right? We have a professional designer who actually does all our website and everything that does, does every single deck when, whenever we're raising money, he redoes the deck for us. I still have lots of comments. Oh, it's too long, it's not long enough, whatever. But it looks nice, okay? So it looks nice. Everyone knows what needs to go into a deck. It's pretty obvious, you can look it up online, okay? So obviously, what's the idea, what's the problem you're solving, all that sort of stuff, you can look that up easily. What people don't tell you is make it look nice. It's actually pretty easy to do. You spend a thousand bucks on some design, and then when a potential investor gets it, they're not bored to death by the thing. That's a small practical tip I would, I would take. Know your numbers. So, numbers, when you're talking to investors, when you get through to the next stage, you know, you, you're having that meeting, so on and so forth, the good investors will ask you questions about your business in terms of what's the customer lifetime value, what's your acquisition cost, what's your average first time sale. These are the sort of numbers you need to know off the top of your head. In fact, don't worry about just raising money. If you don't know these numbers on a day-to-day -day running your business sort of thing, you're in trouble. You should, you should live with those numbers because that's, that's what your business is. It's just a collection of numbers. It's acquisition cost, first time sale, lifetime value, and so on and so forth. That's how you build out your case for investment, okay? The acquisition cost is $1,000. The lifetime value is $10,000. If you give me a million dollars, we can spend that on a million, no, $10,000, $1,000 acquisitions, 
and we'll get this many customers who will generate this much money for us. If you can present that clearly to investors, it makes raising so much easier because you're basically saying this is a machine that makes money, you just need to put money into it, then out the other end we generate 10 times return. So that's, that's a big one, knowing the numbers. Spread the net. So another thing that I hear quite a bit is, um, oh, this guy's going to put in 100,000. This guy's going to put in 200,000. It's about to happen, so on and so forth. You know what? It may be about to happen, but uh, it may also not be about to happen. There's a lot of potential deals that don't happen for whatever reason, you know? Someone <laughs> changes their mind. Unless you have the dollars in the bank and the documentation signed, there is no deal. So spread the net as wide as possible. Every single potential investor you can think of, every connection you can think of, you should be going after them. Even if you've got commitments for you know, a million dollar raise, you should still be talking to people because people inevitably drop out on, on a round, inevitably. So re really focus on that. Um, and that really leads to the next one, which is raising is your job. It's the CEO of a startup, a startup that requires venture capital, I'm not saying any startup, but if it's a startup that requires venture capital, you have one job, and that's to make sure there's enough money in the business to continue growing at the rate that you want to grow at. There's two ways to do that. One, you raise money. Two, you generate revenue. Clearly, generating revenue is preferable, no doubt. But at the end of the day, if, if you're in a business that's looking to grow fast and you acquire that venture capital, this is your job. So you need to ensure there's other people in your business who can do whatever else needs to be done done. You know, in our business, developing the tech, doing the legal work, managing the legal work, ensuring the marketing is done correctly, ensuring our inbound sales is working, ensuring that our outbound sales are working, all those sort of things, you can't spend all your time doing it. You need to be raising money. So make sure you have other people in the business who can support you um, to, to, to do what you need to do. Because at the end of the day, the whole thing collapses if you don't have the money. Okay. Don't undervalue your startup. We, and I was just talking to another friend who's in startup in San Francisco earlier today. He said, yeah, look, um, uh, I got an email from a friend. He's saying, oh, I need $40,000. Um, an investor's gonna give it to me. He just wants 60% of the company and, and, and then we can, we can get to work, all right? And he's, wondering, he's asking this friend over in San Francisco what he should do. Well, you know, firstly, you should forget about trying to run a business because he's clearly you know, not capable. And he said that, <laughs> this sort of thing we see a lot. People undervalue their startup, okay? So the, the, the mentality is that it's not really worth anything now. It's not generating much revenue. It's, you know, we don't have a team, so on and so forth. Therefore, we give away, we can give away a whole chunk and we're getting, hey, 50 grand, we're getting 100 grand. Great, we'll give away a whole of equity for that. If that's the way you're thinking, you're never going to scale your business because you might, you might get through the first round and be doing okay, but then too much of your business is owned by investors. And proper investors, venture capital investors down the track, are not going to want to invest in that business because there's not enough incentive for the founders, employees, and everyone else to continue running the business. So it's very important not to undervalue your startup. Now, the flip side of that is don't be greedy. So. You then see people who think their business is worth a ridiculous amount of money, and who don't do like they've got money. They've got money on the table. Someone wants to do a deal, is willing to give them a million dollars for twenty percent of the company, and they don't do it because they think it's worth more. Well, you know what? That opportunity to get that 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 that, that capital is not necessarily going to come back. So there's a fine line between undervaluing it and, and being greedy, but you know. If there's a bunch of money and it's a reasonable deal, you take it even if it's not exactly what you want. Finally, don't mess up the legals. And I'm not talking about the, you know, complying with all the rules and regulations around raising money, which is what Ursula's going to talk about. What I'm talking about is the documentation, particularly the shareholder agreement, which sets out how the company will be run. Because if you have a savvy investor, i.e. venture capital style investor, uh, you need to be very, very careful about how that company is run. What, how, do, how are decisions made? If you want to sell the company, what happens? If you want to borrow money in the company, what happens? If you want to increase your salary, what happens? A lot of those decisions will be made according to the shareholders agreement. You need to be very, very careful about how that's structured, how that's drafted. So 
they're the sort of 10 tips that, um, that, that I sort of came up with on this. It's obviously shorter than 20 minutes, so the plan was to take questions afterwards, but what I think would be better is if Ursula talks first, and then we can both kind of get up and, and then you guys can ask any questions you have on this or whatever, what Ursula's going to talk about. Okay? Thank you very much for coming tonight. We're particularly delighted to see this group because people who want to raise capital are one of the primary groups that we hope to help when we started Legal Vision. Why am I here at Legal Vision? What are one, one of the things we're doing? We're trying to bring excellent lawyers to startups to help you help your businesses reach their potential. Small businesses, particularly startups, with the employers, with the innovators. And if enough Australian small businesses don't raise money, you're not going to reach your potential. You're not going to go national, you're not going to go international. The more we hear about capital raising, the more we talk about it, the more we share our stories of capital raising, the more you're going to raise your capital and that's going to have a significant impact on your business and other businesses across Australia. I'm here to talk about how you raise capital, who you raise it from and what you need to say and do. Why do I know what I'm talking about about capital raising? My background is in big law firms. I was a senior lawyer at Baker and McKenzie working in Australia and overseas. I did a number of capital raising deals, including IPOs. That's helping companies list on the stock exchange. Um, I was also a director at Merrill Lynch and spent many years helping companies raise capital. Um, in fact, the smallest capital raising I've done was about uh, helping a company raise about 25,000 for an app, which has now gone national. The largest was a $1.6 billion IPO for Spark Infrastructure, which is a big infrastructure fund. <laughs> so, regardless of how much you want to raise, from $25,000 to $1.6 billion, we can help. So I'm going to talk about how you obtain investment, who, where are you going to get this money, and what. What documents do you need, what do they cover, including what goes in your pitch document. Okay, how? The easy way, tap your parents on the shoulder for a trust fund advance, just grab it from the money tree, Marry Wells. Hell, I'd marry Beyonce if she'd have me. Why not? <laughs> None of us would be here if we had this. It's not going to get us the money we want. Maybe Beyonce would, but in absence of marrying Beyonce, what are we actually going to do? 
There's two big picture paths to raise money. The first is a prospectus, which are those big documents you've seen companies use when they list on a stock exchange. About 50 to 100 pages of solid information. Three years audited accounts, industry analysis, risk factors. They're used by companies who are listing and companies who are listed. There's very specific rules that they have to follow. Why would you go through all of that pain? Because it allows you to raise any amount from anyone. Any amount you want from anyone in Australia and following rules around the world. It's not relevant for the stage any of us are at now. So we're on the second path, which is no disclosure document, which means no formal 100 page prospectus. It doesn't mean no disclosure at all. If you're a startup, if you're an SME, you have to go this route. And the key rule is you can only raise from specific groups. Who thinks crowdfunding's legal in Australia? It's actually not legal in Australia yet. Nope. You can't get small amounts of money from hundreds of people. You can't sell your shares for small amounts of money to hundreds of people. You can pre-sell services, you can pre-sell <laughs> records, you can pre-sell t-shirts. You can't sell small amounts of shares to hundreds of people across Australia. You have to follow the specific rules about who you can offer to. So, who can you offer to? It's pretty easy. Look for the people with this t-shirt. Shut up and take my money. There's not very many of them. So, who can we really offer to? These are the four main groups that the companies in this room are allowed to offer to. Government policy is you can either raise a small amount from normal mums and dads, what they call retail investors, or you can raise a lot of money from people who should know what they're doing. That's basically the categories here. And I'll go through each of these in more detail, but you can raise from, you can do a small scale offering, you can raise from sophisticated investors, you can raise from professional investors, you can raise from senior management. These are your groups. Unless and until you list or get a prospectus, this is who you need to raise money from. So what's a small scale offering? It's known as the friends, family and fools round. You might have heard that expression. You can raise up to $2 million from up to 20 investors in any 12 month period. That's as close as Australia's got to crowdfunding at the moment. It's a 20 person cap, which is clearly not widespread crowdfunding. You have to know them, they have to have some personal connection with you. This is where most people start. This is getting money from your parents, wealthy family members, uh, friends that feel like taking a punt. It might get you a certain way, but you're capped at this 20 people, 12 months, $2 million. We know most of you are looking at raising $1 million plus. If you have wealthy friends, this might get you there but you're probably going to be looking at the next category more closely. The next category are sophisticated investors. They're the people known as angel investors. Angel investors, high net wealth, sophisticated investors. How do you know who they are? They either have to invest half a million in your business, minimum, or they have to fit the definition of sophisticated investor. 
That means someone who's got net assets of two and a half million or more, or someone who's had a gross income of 250,000 or more for a couple of years. And they have to have a certificate from an accountant. The people in these groups and a bunch of other angel investor groups, they have to meet those criteria to be in those groups. So there are semi-formal groups across Australia, like SCALE, like Sydney Angels, like the Angel Investment Network. And it's groups of these sophisticated investors who are allowed to invest in your business. Give you an idea of the kinds of money they're prepared to invest. Sydney Angels typical investment is a few hundred thousand up to say 700,000. That will often come from a few people putting 100,000 in each. Even if these people are worth 10 million plus, they generally invest by spreading their risk, small amount over a bunch of different companies because so many startups fail. They also only put a small amount into startups and the rest of it's in safe investments. Sydney Angels are particularly looking at companies worth about one to two million plus. They're looking at online companies, life sciences, engineering, that tends to be their focus. Scale has been particularly set up for women founded businesses. Their most recent investment was 1.25 million in a company called Switch Automation. It's an old software company. So they're throwing around decent amounts of money as well. You might wonder how far an angel investor can get your business. It's a really good place to start for a small but vital amount of money to get you to a stage where you can value your company higher. For example, Facebook in 2004 raised 500,000 from Peter Thiel, who was ex-PayPal. Does anyone know what percentage of Facebook he bought for his 500,000? He bought 10%. I think we call him a happy man today. <laughs> so that valued Facebook at about $5 million. A year later, does anyone know what it was valued at? It was up to $98 because their next round was $12.5 million, get them to $98 million valuation. And then a the year later, they did their Series B, next big round, got 27.5 in, and they were then valued at 500 million. So that's an idea of the enormous returns an angel investor could make on the incredibly rare successful company like Facebook. To get that kind of returns, they're making 100 investments, most of them will fail. Once you've done that first round and your company's valued at a lot more, then you may consider looking at professional investors. <coughs> professional investors have assets of 10 million plus that they're investing and, and or they hold a financial services license. So your angel investors are just rich people. Your professional investors are professional businesses set up to invest. There's tech funds, there's health funds, there's all kinds of industry specific funds and some general funds. <coughs> if and when you get to this stage you need to identify who's going to be the right professional investor for you. Macquarie's an interesting one. A friend of mine co-founded Temple and Webster. They got a few million dollars from Macquarie a couple of years ago. He said, as Macquarie will always do a deal, it's just what terms they'll give you. When you start dealing with these guys, if and when your lawyer is your best friend because they're your defence against people who are professionals at maximising their return. Quite that, so yeah. Um, CVC. Uh, I mean, you might remember Qantas and Ansett a few years ago had a duopoly across Australia. And flight prices were sky high and Impulse Airlines came in. CVC invested a few million, doubled their valuation. Two years later, Impulse had had such an impact on Qantas that it was worth Qantas to buy them out 
and rebadge them as Jetstar. The CVC guys doubled their money in two years. They were pretty happy. Quadrant, bigger again, they're looking at investing 50 million plus. So it's good to know these people exist, but they're at the kind of 5 million plus plus stage. And last of all, you're allowed to issue shares and or raise money from senior management of your business. So that's your founding team, your key employees, and that's because they know the business so well. They don't have to be a professional investor, they don't have to be a sophisticated investor. They know the business so well that they're allowed to invest and you can issue shares to them. So probably the next step any of you would be at is either going to friends and family or going to your sophisticated investors. What do you say to them and what documents do you need? First thing it's worth noting is you are not allowed to publicly advertise your offer. No public adverts, nothing in the paper. Wouldn't be prudent to put something on Facebook. No unsolicited meetings, no cold calls. You can't be spamming people. It's actually one of the rules of doing these private raisings. You can go to people you know, and you can go to those business introduction services. You can go to the angel investor groups. That's all fine. Another one you may have heard of is the Australian Small Scale Offering Board. They've raised about 144 million for Australian companies to date, and we can help you out if you want to go there as well. What do you say? I'll go through what you put in a pitch in a moment, but first I'll just touch on what you don't do. You're not allowed to make false or misleading statements. You're not allowed to engage in misleading or deceptive conduct. Most importantly, not by omission. So if you're leaving stuff out that makes what you're saying misleading or deceptive, you've got potential risk. So, very importantly, I'll touch on your first step is pitching. And you have a pitch document to do that, and I'll go through the kind of things you might want to put in that and why. Once people are interested, your next step legally is a term sheet, which is just a summary of the key things you're discussing. For example, you'll put a million dollars in, uh, you'll get 10%, you'll get the right to appoint a director. <coughs> We'll have board meetings once a quarter so you know what's going on. You can step in if I try to employ anyone over a certain amount of salary. You have a say if I try to sell the business. You and the investor negotiate the key commercial terms. And then last of all, the shareholders agreement, which I'll go into in more detail. So what do investors want to know? Even when you get in front of investors, you're going to be very polished, very concise, but you need to cover these seven key things for them to take you seriously. Why is your product or service needed? Crucial question. What problem are you helping to solve? And there's some great examples. Airbnb solving a problem problem on the one hand of people having these spare rooms and not making any money, and on the other hand, problem of people needing more flexible accommodation, cheaper accommodation. Yeah. Uber has a great why story as well. There's lots of great why stories. We had this idea that small businesses might need great lawyers. Here we are. Mm. Yeah. Who is on your team? This is so important. <coughs> Investors know you're going to try things that aren't going to work. 
you're gonna fail, there's gonna be difficulties. They're actually backing you to pivot and solve problems as much as they are backing your concept. They wanna know that between you and the core team, you've got the skills and also the resilience to see this through. How does your product provide a solution? What's your marketing strategy? What are your financials? This is gonna be crucial the whole way through your business journey, it already is. They wanna know you know your numbers now and in the future. And last of all, what's your exit strategy? They're not investing in your company till they die. They're not marrying you. They want in, they want a few years, and they want out with a good return. That's, that's the focus that these early stage investors have. In, make lots, out. So they want to know who you're going to sell to and how, whether it's selling to another business or listing on the stock exchange or something else. You might speak to 100. You might get to the term sheet stage with one. If you have that in mind as a ratio, you'll hopefully be well prepared for some of the conversations in terms of trying to get investment. When someone finally says yes, that's when you're looking at, right, what are the key terms? What am I willing to give away? What's not negotiable? There's loads on the internet about this, and we support our clients very well through this. And we separate out the negotiations into two big categories. Business decisions you want in your court, but things that fundamentally affect the shares, like issuing shares to new people, diluting the existing shareholders, selling the entire business, pivoting the entire business. If it relates to the fundamentals of a company, that's where shareholders are going to want to have a say. Everything's negotiable, but we fight very hard for our clients, the founders, to maintain enough control so they are running the business day to day. If an investor wants day to day control, they can step in and work for free like everyone else. None of you want that. They don't want it, you don't want it. You want to set up that you make all the you and the founding team make all the decisions day to day. You're reporting back to them once a quarter, once every six months. Very broad oversight is all you're looking for. They're gonna to want to do due diligence. What's that? That's them investigating your business. Now, it depends on the investor how much due diligence they're gonna to want to do. Your friends, your family, they're gonna take what you say. And you'll have obviously some information in your deck. The more sophisticated the investor, and the more you want to raise, the more they're gonna to want to check things. You won't have your accounts audited at this stage, probably. They might ask for some kind of audit. There's various things that they can ask for. It's, once again, it's negotiable, between you and them, depending on how much money you want. We cannot overemphasize how important it is to retain enough of your business to incentivize you. And once again, we fight very hard for our founders on this. We want the investor to walk away saying, I'm deliberately <coughs> taking yes, less of your business, so you can grow a huge business. That's the goal. If they take too much, there's not enough room for growth for you or for them. <laughs> so, take less, grow more, is how we negotiate for founders. Second last, your shareholders agreement. That's when you take a couple of pages of term sheet and turn it into a very detailed document. There's a lot of negotiating on what decisions the founders can make and what decisions the shareholder investors want to be involved in. And we take that same broad view. Company, operations, day-to-day -day business, 
That's what you're backing the founders for. But a few big picture decisions, that's what shareholders want to be involved in. A classic one is who's involved in the decision to issue more shares? Investors are like, oh, I want to be involved in that decision because it dilutes me. No. If you have 20 investors, you don't want to be trying to get them all in a room and decide, hey, let's, shall we do this deal or not? You want the power to make the decision that we need to raise more money and at what amount with the founders. But then you give the other shareholders what's called a right of first refusal so they can buy shares to top themselves up. So they're not involved in the business decision, but they do have protection against anti-dilution by what's called a first right of refusal. There's about 10 of those key decisions between the majority and the minority. Even when you get to this stage, there's lots of support that can be given. The crucial thing to know is that if you're dealing with sophisticated investors, they know what they're doing and they'll try and get as much power and oversight as possible. It's in your interest to pull that back so you can run your business day to day. Just a couple of practical things. Share subscription agreement. You're running around talking to 100 people. You've got, say, six or seven saying yes. You can sign them up with a simple agreement each, so you actually have a legally binding commitment. Like they may each say, I'll put in 200,000, but we're only proceeding if you raise up a million altogether. That means for you, you've got them on the hook. And for them, they know that their investment isn't treated unless you raise the full amount. It just stops people saying yes and then changing their mind, which is important because you will be busy trying to raise this money. <coughs> and last but very importantly is share vesting. Most great startups want to issue shares to their employees. If you issue a bunch of shares to someone on Monday and they resign on Tuesday, you're in trouble, you're stuffed. So we help you put in place vesting agreements, either vest those shares over time, or because of our quirky tax rules, you get the shares up front, the employee gets the shares up front, but you, the company, can buy them back. We usually try to do them with what's called a one-year cliff, so people have to work for a year before they get any shares at all. <coughs> Getting shares in your company is a big deal, and if anything goes wrong, you want to be able to take those shares back so you can issue them to other employees. Absolutely last of all, boring thing that you pay lawyers to do, company secretarial, that's just the legals to make the actual share issue happen. It's, it's minutes, it's certificates, it's updating the share register. It's exciting because it's the culmination of all of your hard work actually being legal. Thank you very much, everyone. And Lachlan and I are happy to answer any questions you have, commercial side, legal side. Go for it. You didn't um, mention banks in this at all, and I'm interested to know how you see the bank or bank out one of them. Everybody's got a bank, obviously. Mm. And how you see banks play a role in the initial, at least the initial funding, where they might put a few hundred thousand dollars against some equity that you might be holding, putting up, versus the going to friends type of thing. Sure. Business. Banks are not going to put up money against your equity. No, no way. So put up money against your house. If you own, if you own a property, which you own outright, they'll be happy to lend you, well, up to the value of the property. They're not going to lend a startup. Speculative startup, um, no. you know. So, what um, do you think about the concept of so putting up property, making your own your office, whatever? Sure. As, well, a, as a first round, sure. rather than going to it. Depends how rich you are, right? I wouldn't, personally, uh, because the chances of uh, your business succeeding are not that high. That's the reality, right? Most startups fail. So, um, for you to put up your house or office as security, if you own it, if you own the office, is well, you have to be <laughs> very uh, either very very confident mm -hmm. or 
you know, have enough funds to be able to lose the, the, the relevant asset. Okay, so this is on the basis of percentages, i.e. an investor will invest in 20 different companies on the hope that one would go. Mm -hmm. If you're investing 100% of your interest in your company, you've got a one in, let's say, 20 chance of winning and nine down. That's right. Money. That's why when, that's why, you know, we're, we're raising a round right now, for instance, right? None of the, none of the main employee or founder shareholders in our business are putting money into the company because from a risk allocation perspective it doesn't make sense to do that you should whatever spare cash that you have you should put in i don't know stock market or or, or housing or, or something other than startups right because so much of your net worth is actually tied up into the equity of your business and and, and that might actually be worth nothing quite frankly so you've got to back yourself as well in terms of factoring in your time you're going to be drawing an incredibly low salary, if anything, for the first couple of years. So you're investing your time as well as any personal money, which is why the, it's kind of seen as fair. Your sweat, your passion, your focus, your inordinate amount of work, but where possible, someone else's money. There are two instances where, where debt finance can, can make sense. Um, and that this is bank debt finance. One is a working capital facility. So if you're generating significant revenue, um, and an example, and I, I, I guess I'll use Legal Vision as an example. Um, so everyone here who, uh, your customers, most of you will have paid um, upfront into our trust account when, when we did work for you. So you put that money into the trust account. And that work is done, it takes about 22 days, roughly. Uh, for, well, not roughly, it takes exactly 22 days on average for that work to be complete. So we have essentially a month's worth of working capital tied up in, in our trust account. And a bank will look at that and go, okay, well, you know, you are, although they can't take security over a trust account, they will go, look, we know that you're going to get the money. And so in that instance, they might lend you, or they might give you a working capital facility. So if you get to a certain size, you can get debt finance to finance that kind of cash flow issue. You can finance cash flow. You can't finance growth with debt generally um, in, in a startup. It's also worth distinguishing personal assets from business assets. You know, if you're a, a business asset rich company, then you've got something to get debt against. Mm. But for the reasons we've discussed, we suggest keeping personal assets, house, car, separate. Mm. There was another question? Uh, no. Go on. Yeah, um, in relation to uh, um, the cost, well, for example, you approach a, an invest. Now, most startups, uh, they don't make money during the first two years, for example. But um, would the investor already expect you to have a return prior to that two years? What do you mean by making money? Do you mean generating revenue or paying generating a profit? Dividends. Well, paying them back. Yeah, yeah, no. So an investor in, a, in, a, in the startup space will not expect a return in, in two years. They expect a return over you know, a, a 10 year period, really, oh, and maybe five to 10 years. They yeah. expect the company's value will grow, but they expect you'll be putting any cash back into the business. For example, you're primarily hiring more staff, doing more marketing. They're two primary things that you're doing with the money. So they want to see the company value grow, 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million. They're not expecting you to be using cash to pay them dividends. No. They don't want dividends no. because it's not tax efficient to, 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 to get dividends in Australia. So the reason investors, a lot of investors invest in startups is they want to generate a capital return because um, you, know, you get a 25% CDC discount on, 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 on the gain. So they're looking for businesses that are going to generate that kind of a capital return, not, a, not a, an income stream. If you want an income stream, you just invest in bonds or, you know, or, or yeah, bank shares or, or whatever. Yeah. Back there. Yeah. yeah um, question about the. Um, uh, you mentioned about certain managers uh, can make interest in company. Does that include? Uh, and I'm asking a question more from a social impact investment. So there's a board of directors. Um, are they able to invest? Um, can former board members invest? Would they be considered? The the rule is actually senior management. Right. Okay. So you are actually supposed to be working in the business. Um, but remember you've got your, you've also got your 
20 people up to 2 million or if these guys want to invest more and they're wealthy they may well fit into the sophisticated investors you know, net income of 250,000 plus there's a lot of people in Australia well you would hope put it this that. way that yeah. people on your board have, have a net worth of whatever over 2.5 over million. million otherwise you know, they're not going to be much use of kind of you know growing the value of your company right so, so on the whole those people would fit into so that that category right okay so in charity space is a bit different yeah, yeah. but yeah uh, and, and that's uh, that's two million a year so you could only have no, no it's not two million a year yeah, yeah, to raise, two million, yeah you can go to you can go to the general investors, personal yeah, investors yeah 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 and everyone else is on top of that so it's not like the, the angel investors and the professional investors that's that's extra money you can raise. They don't count toward your two million. So if any of those were sophisticated investors, you can take them out of Correct, them. yeah. Everyone that you can put into the other groups, all the other groups, you can raise unlimited numbers of people and unlimited amounts of money. Just so practically though, it is kind of a pain in the ass to have, you know, every year 20 new investors with like putting in 10 grand a pop. Like managing that is not something you want to be doing. So yeah, to start things off, but it's not really something you want to be doing long term, you know, pra practically, you know, because then you've got all these people on the share register, you know. But if they agreed, say, over a three year period in three tranches of mm. investment, then that would be, I mean, that's less to manage in terms of you just raising six million potentially from the same group of people. Yes, you're allowed to. Yeah, you. Yeah, it's got to be very clear that you're not exceeding that two million cap. But yes, you can do that. Yeah. yeah. I'm not too familiar with the equity crowdfunding scene. What's happening in Australia? Mm. Do you know what's going on in that space? Yeah. So um, there's a there's a few things happening. Um, the I guess the first one is the few. There's a few businesses that are, that are out there saying that they. They are doing equity crowdfunding, but they're not really. So the the crowd are only sophisticated investors, right? But you can list your business on the platform, and the the investors uh, sort of are all you know people who are sophisticated investors. But it's, it's a way of kind of getting access to a, a broader um, a broader group of potential investors. There there is legislation, I believe. Yeah. Um, that they're changing the law, but not as much as you would hope. Um, currently, they're talking about. An unlimited number of retail investors, but up to 20,000 per person, which is kind of annoying. Um, it's unfair to people who, it's, they're putting caps on it basically. It's, it's not open slather any amount from an unlimited number of people. There's still restrictions. And again, and this is because the government don't want mums and dads losing a lot of money, right? That's right. correct, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, it's the nanny state. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an interesting one because as, yeah. as people who oppose this say, I can go down to the casino and withdraw my entire life savings and put it on red or black, and that's legal. So why can't I put my entire life savings in a small business? My personal view is let more people invest in more companies, but increase the disclosure requirements. You know, for example, you have to provide accounts each year, blah, blah. More disclosure around making sure the investors know what they're investing in and know what's happening with the business, to me, is a good solution. And again, the point as well with this is there's like smart money and there's dumb money, right? So the, the best investors are people who are actually going to help your business. Who aren't just like, they're not just, not just dollars, right? So in our business, we have investors who have, have helped us a lot with various things. Like we've got one on the board, we've got... Um, you know, a number who are you know, senior executives in, in businesses that can, that can help our business. Those sort of investors are much better than, than just, you know, Can't people putting in 500 yeah. bucks a pop, which is what equity crowdfunding would be. So, you know, there's, there's yeah, the, the rules, I, I don't think the rules around equity crowdfunding are really going to stop people with a great business raising money, really. I mean, you know, if your business is that great, there are people out there who, who, will, who will invest. We're raising capital at the moment, and the discussion we're having with a lot of VCs is around uh, how did you come up with that valuation? Mm -hmm. Then you saw it's the numbers, and one VC agrees, and the second that one doesn't. Mm -hmm. In early stages, you know, the valuation uh, of the company, you know, how do you manage that? 
Sure. So, um, well, it's whatever you can get away with is the, is the yeah. answer, right? Whatever you can negotiate. Um, it depends on the business, right? Um, in, our, in our space, uh, the, way, the way we do it is we say, look, we're, we're a tech business, we acquire online, we, we, we build our own technology, so on and so forth. On the other hand, investors will say, well, you're a law firm, you, you, employ, you have to employ lawyers, um, you know, you do legal work. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and so a, a software as a service business will get a, you know, 10 to 15 times multiple on revenues. A law firm will sell for, you know, if you're lucky, two times revenue, mm -hmm. less sometimes. Mm -hmm. So what, what you end up doing is uh, we'll, we'll do three and a half, four times revenue as a multiple. So you kind of look at the industry, you look at what businesses in the industry are, uh, are selling for or raising money for, uh, raising money out, and it's that kind of, uh, that, that's sort of how you do it. Now, if, if your business is so fantastic, you don't even need to look at multiples and industry multiples because there's so many people who want to invest and it's basically, you know, if you look at all the unicorns in Silicon Valley now, are those businesses were, uh, but you know, are they raising in a multiple? No, they're raising because they can, they can raise, and there's enough VC money sloshing around that they'll t they'll just take whatever valuation they're given. So it really depends a little bit on supply and demand. Well, it's all supply and demand. Then, so. But for you, looking in your industry for which pockets getting the highest multiple is the most relevant thing mm. you can probably do. And you start there with the valuation, and then if you go down a little bit, that's why it's don't be too greedy, right? With, yeah, I mean, if someone's going to give you a six times multiple, great, but if they're giving you a three times multiple and it gives you enough money to, you know, build a business and not give you too much equity, then you just do the deal and move on, right? You don't spend too much time negotiating valuation if you can avoid it. Um, with vesting, you spoke about a, a one year clip. Does that mean that if your employee quits within a year, they don't get the shares? Right. If your employee right? quits within a, a, a year, cliff means they have to work for you for a year before they get to keep their first lot of shares. Is there a maximum amount of time you can set for that cliff? You well, can you set have, whatever you can, you can whatever negotiate. You yeah. The conversation between around shares really depends on what you're paying. The closer you're paying to market salary, the fewer shares you're going to need to attract them. The lower you're paying compared to market salary or past salary, the more shares. It's that, okay. that tends it's to be the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. The, the, the way to do it really is it's four year vesting, one year cliff, and that is it. No negotiation. That's the best way of doing it. And the reason for that is you can go Silicon Valley, every startup in Silicon Valley is four year vesting, one year cliff. Every single startup. That's, that's, that's how it's done. So does that mean if you quit before a year, you get nothing. Yeah. It, it takes four years to get the shares otherwise. Well, no, they vest yeah. over it. So if you quit oh, after right. a year and one day, you yeah. get 25% yeah. of your shares. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, you don't want to be agreeing different deals with every single employee. It's a total pain in the ass. Yeah. Right? Because the way these, these things are done now is, is depending on where you are in your business, is generally with um, the, the, the ESOP safe harbor valuation methodology that the, the ATO brought out a few months ago and if you're doing it using that kind of a structure you want everyone to be on the same deal because otherwise your cap table's a mess you always you can't work out how much of your your, your stock option pool you've given away it's, it's a nightmare so there's two main ways to give employee shares so one is your your key person pool that's when you do what's called that's when you do vesting where they get a decent percentage over this work for a year, one year cliff, and then a quarter over four years. For your general employee staff though, there's a whole separate thing which is your employee share option plan. And that's new law, one July this year, specifically to help startups give relatively small percentages of shares to a lot of employees. It's just one set of documents, one set process, and it's quite easy to sign new employees up. So there, there's really one set of process for, for key people, and then a more simple employee share option plan process for many employees in the future, getting a small amount of shares. And just to be clear, that's based, I mean, key people, it's based more on when the individual person becomes a shareholder. Okay, so with your founders, the company's worth nothing at the, the time that 
you get issued with your shares, and therefore you do that generally through the shareholders agreement and through that structure. But if your company is worth a reasonable amount of money and you're raising money at a you know a high valuation or whatever, you can't then issue shares through the shareholders agreement because of the tax implications. It's bad for tax reasons. So that's when you, you use the employee share option plan and, and the relevant rules that the ATO have passed around that. So, so yeah, it's, but that if anyone's thinking about doing that, come come talk to us because we, we do that we do like three of them a month at the moment, and so um, that's that's pretty. It's not difficult to do, but if if you screw it up, um, it's not good. Put it that way. If you issue shares to someone, hundred thousand dollars worth. Of, if you issue shares that are clearly worth a hundred thousand dollars. It's like that person has to pay tax on the hundred thousand dollars, which is a disaster because they've got something they can't sell and they've got a tax bill on it. That's why these employee share option plan rules have come in, and they basically say you pay tax when you sell. But yeah, it's a nice, clear structure to work through. Um, size of the employee option pool and uh, options versus shares for employees under the SOP. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Your viewpoint. So. Um, the option pool, that's a tricky one, because it's all about, there are, if there are any investors here, um, put up your hand, because this is all about uh, kind of not being sneaky, but um, you know, doing things in the right way so that you take as little dilution as possible, right? So with the option plan, um, every time you get new investors on board, like a, a VC sort of investor on board, you will, um, they'll say, well, how big is the option option pool and how much have you issued of it, right? So if you've got an option pool which is 10% and you've issued 9.5% of that, they're gonna to wanna to increase the option pool, right? Before they invest, right? So they're not diluted by the increase in the option pool, right? What you wanna do is keep the option pool as small as conceivably possible and then say, if you can negotiate well on this, you say, yeah, we'll increase it after you've invested. So the dilution takes place after the new shareholders come on board and therefore you're taking less dilution yourself as a founder. Now, it all depends a little bit on how sophisticated your investors are. Um, it's all negotiation, so on and so forth. So the approach that I like to take is keep it as small as possible for give yourself 18 months worth of options. So you, you should know, okay, we need to hire this guy, we need to hire this, um, this, this lady, we need to hire these people. We think we're going to have to do, you know, we think we're going to get this kind of valuation at the time we're in the options, so we'll need this number of shares. Okay, we need roughly, say, 10% option pool, right? You then go, the next round of in, in investment, say if you've got three investors who, who want to invest, you say, look, we're going to increase the option pool post your investment. That's the deal, take it or leave it, if you can. If they're the only investor, you say, yes, sorry, we'll increase the option pool now. And, you know, so um, the traditional way of doing it is you have a 20% option pool. In terms of options or shares, um, options is best for various tax reasons, which are too boring to go into now, but options is, is generally best. Yeah. When you read stuff about US companies, their tax rules are different. They always talk about issuing shares over time. We do it as a clawback because of our tax rules. Just one thing to bear in mind when you're reading for on US forums. Mm. Yeah. Good question. Could you maybe talk a little bit about the pros and cons of um, convertible notes and whether they've got any roles to play in? Sure. Yep. Um, so convertible notes are great uh, if you can uh, convince investors that, uh, to invest in them. Right. So. Um, we we're raising on we're closing convertible uh, this week. Uh, anyone wants to invest, you know, it's a bit of space <laughs> open. Um, the reason we are doing that now is because we're not raising enough for me to go. Right, we're going to negotiate valuation. That's the big thing. And negotiating valuation is pain, um, particularly with. Well, it's a pain. Full stop. Because you want to be as high as possible, and investor wants to be low as possible, right? Um, so. The benefit of the convertible note is it's a simple document. Um, it's a simple structure. Um, we we do a lot of them, and and, it, and you get it done. You can get a few people can raise on, on on the same round. You can say we need to close this by the thirtieth of uh, of October, 
sign, transfer the money. It's a, it's a I don't know, a 15 page document. We're not negotiating, not negotiating valuation, we're not negotiating shareholder rights, we're not negotiating board seats. <coughs> Just sign and give us your money. It's great. Now, on the other hand, there's a lot of things in, in a convertible note that are potentially not great for an investor. A perfect example is the valuation cap. Um, whether you can get away with no valuation cap. Which in a sense is... Which is, which is negotiating valuation, right? The reason that I don't like the valuation cap is I feel it puts a ceiling on what you're going to raise out in the next round. Um, so, they're good. Um, it does scare away smaller investors. On this round that I'm doing right now, we've had sort of less sophisticated investors who can't get their head around a convertible nut. So it scares away but then they're going to put in less money anyway and they're the sort of investors you want. Maybe not necessarily. And so conventionally, is it the case that the convertible mode is the option of the investor to convert directly if they choose or is it of your, of the... You know, no, it's neither. It happens on a trigger event, right? Yeah. So it'll be A, raising more money, generally what it is. So if the company raises $2 million or more, it automatically converts. Uh, Two million dollars is an example. It can be any any set amount, right? Um, it converts on IPO or on trade sale, right? And it converts generally um, at a maturity day. So if you have a two, two year maturity and you haven't raised any money, I mean, generally the business you'll be out of business anyway, so don't worry about it. But the note still allows you to convert, and it's on a multiple of generally multiple of revenues. So you go. The last three months' revenues annualised times whatever the relevant multiple in your industry is. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this um, examples of investments you've given, like Sydney Angels, uh, Scale Angel mm -hmm. Investment, and all the others, mm -hmm. do they only invest on certain types of businesses or any? On the whole different groups will have a different focus. So Sydney Angels is particularly looking at uh, tech, engineering, uh, scale is particularly set up to support women founding businesses. There are different funds for health, biotech. So quite a few are just looking at kind of general innovative tech, but then there are more specific ones. The information on where these angel investors group together. It's, it's reasonably readily available information online. They don't want you to waste their time, so they'll tell you the, the basic parameters of the kind of companies they're looking to invest in. Yeah. It's also easier to raise money from people who get your industry. So that's who they want to invest in. That's who you can explain your business better to. So it's worth finding out which groups or which, when you're larger, which funds invest in your industry? A lot of these angel groups like to kind of sit around and, and watch people pitch to them, but don't actually invest that much. It, the individual angels, right? So there'll be a few people who'll put in good chunks of money, but a lot of them are just there to kind of hang out and look at startups and, and feel important. So, <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't. I would never go and think, oh, this is really, you know, angel groups are, are, are kind of going to be announced as a raising a round of capital. They may, you know, you, you've got to know some, you've got to get someone involved who may then know those people. Going and pitching to an angel investment group, I think the chances of raising money aren't high. I only say that because we didn't raise money uh, from Sydney Angels when we originally pitched, so I'm still bitter. What's that? Do any sort of reason why? Ah, uh, Evan, do you remember? Yeah, uh, yeah some. They just come up with any old reason to say no, you know? Yeah, but they'll always come up with a reason, right? The reason is that they're not good enough investors, right? They don't understand what's going to make them money. <laughs> I imagine, though, that a group like that, there must be a veneer of scepticism. Oh, totally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. No, 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 because this, this is what it comes down to is a lot of these investors think they're going to invest in the next Facebook, you know? It's like, okay, well, great, fine, good luck, <laughs> but not really going to happen. 
And so they're looking for something that's not there. That's my view. Now, having said that, you end up, if you do well, you persist, you generate revenue, you know, you work things out, you will find people who believe in what you're doing, you know? So, and it's a good experience as well, going to these kind of groups, pitching or whatever, even if, you know, you don't get investment, you kind of, you get feedback, you're refining what you're doing, it's, it's all helpful. Just on the disclosure uh, stuff, like when you, there's various picture books around, and a lot of them are very informal, very sort of, I mean, how conscious are you going to be when you're talking in a pitch, as opposed to you know, getting some more attention? But how, you know, sort of religious the place you're going to generally get in trouble is on your financial projections because you've put numbers on a page and it's very easy to see if you met those projections or not it applies all the way through capital raising particularly if and when you ever list you protect yourself with assumptions you set out briefly you discuss what are the assumptions that make you think you're going to hit those numbers so what about just there is a kind of market standard strong disclaimer and so we yeah. obviously provide it to all of our investors but don't put untrue information in your deck and expect your disclaimer to protect you like well don't no, even worry about your disclaimer yeah. protecting you if it's like you have to be realistic well within the bounds of reason when you're when you're raising money right so the worst thing that can happen generally is people look at the numbers and go, that doesn't make sense. To, like, you know, how do you justify this? That's, that's more the issue. Australia is a small place to raise money. If you try and fail but on good grounds, that's one thing. If you lie to people, you know, you've stuffed your business reputation. The investing community is pretty small. You don't want to stuff your reputation. And you can protect yourself just by giving proper assumptions around it. Uh, what, are, what about the legal ramifications if your business fails and you're, you're, you've raised money? Sure. Is, I don't know. Well, that's the limited liability company, right? That's the great that's thing about the it. That's the entire reason people incorporate a company yeah. that absent fraud, misrepresentation, some kind of dishonesty, if you have to shut your business down with 100000 worth of debt, you just walk away, basically. They sell the assets, they pay what they can to... Um, anyone that you owe money to, any investors, and you walk away. So That's why you don't put your house, your yeah. own personal assets up. It's the foundation of Western capitalism, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, your lead into tonight was about how to get investors and not lose control of your company, and you've certainly given some very good pointers. Mm. Can you give us some anecdotal evidence as to what sort of being, I assume there's a few proprietors in this room that maybe have started their own companies, running their companies, and then have just thought over time, you know, I'd like to get investors, but I'm really sick, like me, I'm concerned about losing control of my business. So, mm. the classic 11th hour rule and all this sort of stuff you well, hear about. The classic one is um, Savarin from Facebook not reading and not understanding, not understanding what he's reading in a shareholders agreement. So, they put together a shareholders agreement, he got, I think, 5% of Facebook, but he didn't have any right to vote on issuing more shares. I think they said 75% of investors, in, of shareholders had to agree to raise more money. And he was 5%, so he couldn't block it. So he started with 5% and then the majority kept issuing themselves more shares, issuing new investors new shares. He had no right of first refusal. He couldn't maintain his percentage. It just dwindled away to a very small amount. And now he's a billionaire. <laughs> Let's be fair, a small amount of Facebook is still a good thing to own. So, but what we see from a minority perspective, people don't know what's missing from shareholders' agreements. There's an industry standard that the um, AVCAL have put out, Venture Capital Association, and to the untrained eye, it looks kind of fair because you don't know all the things that are missing from it. So, it's you partly get advice to negotiate what's there, and you partly get advice to add in all those clauses that protect you as a founder that you didn't even know you needed. This practically too, I mean, you don't need to own 50% of a business to really control it, quite frankly. Um, 
if you have allies within the, uh, the, the, the shareholders register, if you, you know, at the end of the day, investors don't want to run your business, do they? So they want you there, they want you motivated. If you raise a few rounds of, of capital, you will end up losing control of the company, right? I've got friends who started a business five years ago, they've now raised over 100 million, they're raising their, their, their round now at half a billion um, pre-money, they, they own like, I don't know, 10% each of the business, right? They own 20%. So what, do you think these venture capitalists want to go and run, run, run their business? They don't, no, they, they really don't. So. In terms of anecdotes, a really important one is who's involved in what decisions, and a really important one is who's involved in a decision to raise more money. Because shareholders think all the shareholders should have a say because I was diluting me. No. You want, I'd say, a majority of the board to make the decision because you know how much you want, you know what you're going to do with it. And if there's, you know, time is of the essence. You can't muck around trying to corral all these small investors together and convince them why you're doing it. So you want the shareholders' agreement to say, directors make the decision, but shareholders have a right of first refusal. If they want, if they don't want to be diluted, that's a classic anecdote in terms of balance of power between founders, majority people who run the business, and the silent investors. On the other hand, should we just do one more question, um, and then so you can turn the aircon back on. Yeah, and then afterwards, you know, if you have any questions, you can email them to Ursula um, or myself. Are we going to have um, oh, the presentation? Yeah, yeah, it's being filmed, right? And uh, we can we'll send you the. The film plus the actual presentation. Oh. Right. Can you give us a rough estimate of the costs? Because um, one of the things I've said mm. I work out is how much money to ask for and what to mm. put in there. The, so cost, the cost for the what? Legal cost. Oh, very good price. Very good price. <laughs> <laughs> it's a special for you. Yeah. 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 Um, I know every scenario is different. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean. <laughs> like a shared uh, founders agreement and then like the VC. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, yes, it does depend a bit on how complex the business is. It's just two, 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 fifty percent each shareholders. Very simple, no vesting, so on and so forth. I think we do them for like one and a half, a bit more than one and a half. Um, more complex, two and a half, three. Um, ESOPs we do for a couple of k. Um, you do a package, we do a discount. Um, with us, raising around, you should never be paying more than. Uh, I hope no one has paid more than this. Um, you know, I would say kind of what six, seven for absolutely everything. Um, you know, and it does depend a bit on what you're doing, but um, none of this stuff should should cost more than that. I would say. And for that, five, six, seven, we can incorporate a company, do a good shareholders agreement, set up a vesting agreement that you can. Reuse with your top employees, ESOP, and set up your ESOP. And once again, you reuse your ESOP with all your incoming employees. Yeah. And anyway, yeah. if you're raising money, it's someone else's money anyway, right? So <laughs> there you go. Well, hey. Figure out the sense. So um, on the other hand, of course, remember if if we end up dealing with an investor who has their own lawyer and is being a prick, you know, he, wa he wants to negotiate every single clause in the shareholders agreement. That's going to cost more. Yeah. So you've got to tell your investors this is the this is the documentation, take it or leave it, you know? You don't want to start, the worst thing, we're, our last round we had, I don't know, what, five, six, seven lawyers six investing lawyers. in the round? Worst thing to do. <laughs> don't get lawyers as investors, you know? You end up spending a long time <laughs> negotiating. Long time negotiating. Yeah. So can you... Okay. One, last one, last yeah, one last one, yeah. yeah. Go on. So can you help us select and approach and put together the paperwork to approach an investor? As well as the legal side, Lachlan thrives on helping people with their pitches, basically. So it is possible to, as lawyers, we're helping on the legal side, and we have a lot of industry knowledge around what's fair and what's not. But ultimately, what percentage shares people have to have to have a board seat, um, which decisions are made by shareholders versus directors, they are ultimately commercial decisions for you but we can give you a lot of guidance around it. Mm. Plus, you know, because we have raised our own money, um, there's a commercial aspect we can assist on as well. But more generally, like, you, mm. no one is, no one, there's a lot of people out there sort of 
you know, who help people raise money and, and, and um, sort of advisors and whatnot, who'll take a, a cut of anything you raise and that sort of stuff, I would steer clear of that. You're not going to raise money. You, you should be raising your own capital. You know, people will help you, like <laughs> i.e. Intro, introductions and so on and so forth, introduction fees. I don't like that. I think that um, the best investors don't want to pay introduction fees. The best investors want to meet potential you know, investments, want to meet with staff, so on and so forth. So you should be careful of anyone who says, oh, I'll introduce you to these people if you pay me money, because um, generally they don't know anyone who's got money. Unless you're talking, you know, IPO or raising 100 million or whatever, and then you're going, JP Morgan, can you, you know, can you find some investors? That's a different story. But down at the stage that we're at here, you know, start up. Yeah, that first million, yeah. uh, up to that first million stage for sure. It's kind of a, a you know, you raise it yourself and, and that's sort of. And they're backing you. Yeah. That's, they're actually backing you as much as they're backing your mm-hmm. concept. They need to become, you need to be able to work together. Yeah. So any questions, um, Andre will send around the, uh, the presentation plus the, um, the video and just reply actually to the newsletter email just with any questions at all and then they'll work out whether Ursula will answer it, me or, or someone else who, who knows more. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much.